Bless you. Good morning, church. Come, let us worship Him this morning. Pour your spirit out, pour 
pour your spirit out. So pour your spirit out. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus slain. As he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross. My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor unto Thee. Sent of heaven. God's own Son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed Him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out. So cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor to Thee. Death is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, always free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation.
soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor unto Thee. Praise and honor unto Thee. Praise and honor unto Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to know that all of you are tuned in to listen to the Word of God. Today, I would like to bring you the message entitled, Forget Not All His Benefits, taken from Psalm 103. The Bible continuously instructs us to give thanks and praise to God for all His benefits towards us. Reading from Psalm 103, 1 to 5. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This psalm is written by King David. He tells his soul to praise the Lord. He reminds himself of the benefits that God has continually given to him. And for that, David calls on everything within him to give honour and praise to God. Here, perhaps, after life's long journey, he has learned in all situations, whether good or bad, to give thanks to God because God has been faithful to him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us, In everything, give thanks. But many of us may find that difficult because of bad past experiences or adverse present circumstances. For example, with the danger of COVID-19 still lurking around the corner, waiting to infect an unsuspecting victim. Perhaps the loss of jobs, the loss of income, and even the loss of a loved one. You may wonder why the Bible instructs you to praise the Lord. But here, in Psalm 103, verse 1, David encourages his soul and says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. He tells himself, forget not all his benefits. David knows that man has a tendency to forget, especially good things in their lives. They remember more often, the bad experiences they have. So David is telling us 
to recall and to remember that in spite of what we see now, the difficulty of living with the pandemic, among all things, to remember that God is worthy of praise and that we should not forget His goodness towards us. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Praise the Lord my soul and forget not His benefits. Psalm 34, 9 to 10 tells us, Fear the Lord, you, His holy people, for those who fear Him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who fear the Lord lack no good thing. Psalm 8, 19 says, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. So even this morning, as the Bible says that God loads us with benefits, remember, as Christians, as children of God, we are loaded. Hallelujah. Loaded with what? Loaded with the benefits of God. And what has God given to us? Let us recall, as King David said, the first thing David says that God has forgiven us. We cannot afford to forget God's forgiveness towards each one of us. David begins his benefit with this greatest benefit of all that we can ever have. Forgiveness for our sin. Forgiveness for our sin. Psalm 103, 10 to 12 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. For as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In this passage of scripture, David says that God has forgiven us of two aspects of sin, iniquity and transgression. Iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity can be defined as the inward motivation that drives us towards sin and from doing what is right. No one can see it. It's hidden in our hearts. And what is transgression? Transgression is outward. It means to trespass or overstep a line given. It is the visible manifestation of sin in our lives. So iniquity is our heart and our attitude. Transgression is outward and it is action. Now the serious danger of iniquity is that many of us hide it in our hearts for too long. Iniquity like anger, jealousy, pride, covetousness, all these are hidden in our hearts and no one can see it but only God alone. But God says He can forgive us of this sin in our hearts. And transgression. Transgression is the outward manifestation of sin. And we think that as long as we do not transgress the law, it is fine. No one can see the iniquity in our hearts. But the Bible tells us otherwise. Let's take a look at John 8, where Jesus was teaching at the temple courts and the people were gathered around him. Suddenly, something happened, a commotion. And the Bible says in John 8, 3 to 5, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Can you imagine the humiliation the woman faced being brought before a group 
of men, self-righteous and ready to condemn her for her sin. And the Pharisees, they were waiting for Jesus' reaction. They were waiting for Jesus' reply. The Pharisees, they were concerned about the transgression of the law and they demanded that this woman be stoned to death. Let's see how Jesus dealt with this situation. Verses 6 to 9 says, But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And in Matthew 5, 28, in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is equating inward sin to outward sin. Iniquity and transgression. The Bible says that God in His Son, Jesus Christ, can forgive iniquity that happens in our hearts and transgression that we act out in our lives. So Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But He was wounded, outward bleeding, for our transgressions, he was bruised, inward bleeding, for our iniquities. On the cross, Jesus made provision for both inward and outward sin. The sacrifice was complete in so much that no sin can escape the reach of his forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, this morning, know that sin, whether in your heart, or transgression, outward sin, can be forgiven by the Lord. And it is through the justifying work of Jesus on the cross. It becomes, if you believe, as if you have never sinned. Amen. God chooses not to remember and does not put it to our account because Jesus pay the full penalty for our sin. Only believe this morning that this is truly the benefit that God has given to us through the cross. Then David takes us to the second benefit of the cross. It would be enough if God has forgiven us of our sin. But God is also concerned about our physical healing. He is concerned about our bodies, that we be strong and healthy daily because we house the Holy Spirit within us. So Isaiah 53, 4-5 says, Surely He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered Him punished by God, stricken by Him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Hallelujah. Provision has been made for our physical healing as well. Today, we may struggle to believe that God wants to heal us. Jesus knows the struggle that we have. There will be days when we question or doubt that God can heal us. So in Luke 5, Jesus addressed the matter of healing. There was a paralyzed man who had his friends bring him to Jesus. Because there was such a crowd in the house, they had to break open the roof and lower him and put him at the feet of Jesus. The Pharisees got angry because instead of 
Addressing the physical, Jesus said to the sick man, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Hearing this, the Pharisees accused Jesus of blasphemy, because who can forgive sin except God alone? But Jesus knew what the Pharisees were thinking, and he asked them, Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And Jesus said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Jesus' response should clear our doubts about healing. Jesus is saying that dealing with sin and sickness is equally easy for him. There is no difference because he is God and he is willing to save us, to forgive us of our sins and also to heal our bodies. Amen. Jesus wants to extend this grace of healing to you this morning. If you are sick in your bodies, believe that Jesus died for your sickness. He was stricken for you, so that you may be healed. Amen. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. T.L. Osborne was an American Pentecostal evangelist who travelled and preached worldwide in the latter half of the 20th century. This was what he said. How can we call ourselves a church and not believe in healing and in miracles? I cannot read four pages anywhere in the Bible without encountering miracles. And the God of the Bible is the same today. Amen. German evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, who preached to millions in Africa, says, When I see miracles happening, miracles of healing, miracles of changed lives, miracles of cleansed sinners, I know who is at work. It is Christ. Hallelujah. Christ saves and Christ heals. His provision and sacrifice is sufficient for all of us this morning. So believe, brothers and sisters, that God can forgive, that God can heal you this morning. Hallelujah! The third benefit that Psalms 103 mentions is that our life is delivered from the pit. Verse 4 says, Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. After we have received his salvation, the Lord continues to redeem us from the dangers and pitfalls of life. David knew these pit experiences because he went through them. Some of the dangers that he was in were dreadful and unimaginable. David had a crazy father-in-law in King Saul who wanted to kill him. When he danced before the Lord, his wife Michal criticised him. His wife Michal thought that David was undignified to dance and dance without restraint before the Lord. King David also committed adultery. His children were rebellious. They wanted his throne even before he died. Incest happened in his family. There was murder. There was intrigue. There was an unending list of sin happening in David's family. There are two ways in which we can end up in a pit. The first one is self-doubt. 
pits. David had his fair share in this list. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. The Lord sent prophet Nathan to confront David of this sin and his murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. 2 Samuel 12, 9-10 says, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. As a punishment from the Lord, the baby from Bathsheba died. It was indeed a deep pit for David. For such dark moments in our life, many of us cannot face up to it. Many times we want to blame our circumstances. We want to blame others when we end up in the pit. Like Samson who kept playing and flirting with sin until he fell into the pit. For Samson, it could be that he blamed Delilah for her dressing. So it's always someone else's fault when we are in the pit. It's not ours. So be careful. The truth is we all dig ourselves into a pit when we are careless or when we do not guard our hearts in doing what is right. The second way we can arrive in a pit is to be thrown into the pit by someone else. Let's look at Joseph. Joseph was the favourite of his father Jacob. He thought that his brothers liked him when in fact they hated him. He was so naive to believe that everyone would support him, especially his brothers. When he told them that he had a dream that his brother's sheaves of grain bowed down to his. They got angry. Then later, he told them that he dreamt about the sun and the moon and the eleven stars that bowed down before him. For telling them his dreams, the brothers threw him into a pit, intending to kill him. But later, they sold him off to some traders who were on their way to Egypt. For some of you, the same heart that was once for you is now turned against you. You have arrived in a pit that you did not dig. Psalms 103 tells you it doesn't matter how you arrive in the pit. David tells us to focus on how we can get out of the pit. He is telling us that God can deliver us from danger and that our lives can testify to His full redemption. God wants to redeem us. He wants to deliver us from the difficult situations that we are in right now. Redemption means to return to the original state. So no matter how we may have failed in our lives or others may have failed us, God is able to make all things new for us. Why? Because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's take a look at the character of King Saul's grandson. His name was Mephibosheth. His father was Jonathan, King David's good friend. How King David dealt with Saul's grandson tells us that truly David understood the power of redemption. So 2 Samuel 9.1, David asked, Is there anyone still in the house of Saul to whom... I can show kindness. 
for Jonathan's sake. And there was found in the house of Saul, the son of Jonathan, called Mephibosheth. After the deaths of King Saul and Jonathan, Mephibosheth's nurse took him and fled in panic. In her haste, the child fell or dropped while fleeing. This child grew up a cripple and he stayed in a place of dryness without hope, without the word of God. It was a place called Lodabar, a place of hopelessness. 2 Samuel 9, 6-7 says, So when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honour. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth, who ended up in a place of wilderness, through no fault of his own, is now invited back to the palace. He is returned to his original state and status at the king's table. So believe, brothers and sisters, this morning, that God is able to restore you for all the things that you have lost through no fault of your own. Believe that God can restore for you this morning. Let us not keep limping around as if we are still in a pit and that there is no light on top of us. So today, let us believe that we can boldly take our place at the table because Jesus can redeem and Jesus has redeemed us from destruction. The life of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, shows us that God is not forgetful and that he can restore us back to our position in Christ. That is why Psalms 103 verse 4 says, Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The crown assures us of God's abiding love for us. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. His waywardness did not destroy his father's compassion and loving kindness for his son. The father did not mete out justice to his wayward son, but he extended his compassion toward him when he repented. Psalm 103 13 to 16 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. So how brief and immaterial our lives are. Yet the Lord knows what we are going through and He will meet us at our deepest needs. Why? Because Jesus paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. God not only forgives your sins, heals your diseases, redeems you from destruction, he also crowns you with love and tender mercies. Amen. Lastly, let us look at verse 5. It says, Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
Verse 5 says that the Lord satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It is truly such a huge benefit for each one of us. How many people do you know that are truly satisfied today? What is the source of true satisfaction in life? Let me ask you. Some may think marriage, children, a job, position, wealth can satisfy. But unfortunately, the truth is revealed here in Scripture and it says this, that only God can truly satisfy your desires. When are we going to realise that the things of the world cannot satisfy us? The world and its pleasures may give you some brief satisfaction, but soon it will be followed by much dissatisfaction, no matter your position, your wealth, your status. It is only God that can truly satisfy you. To the Samaritan woman at the well, who was seeking for things in the world to satisfy her, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him shall never thirst. And the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus was actually offering the woman salvation. But the woman misunderstood Jesus and she thought that Jesus was talking about water that could quench her physical thirst. In her life, this Samaritan woman had had five husbands and the man she was living with was not her husband. As Jesus revealed this to her, the woman was astounded and perceived Jesus to be a prophet. Actually, this woman has got the order wrong. She had tried to find satisfaction in one marriage after the other and it has got her nowhere. There was only disappointment for her and Jesus then offered her living water. Do you know, satisfied people are satisfied despite the conditions they are in and the status they have in society. When you still have your first love for Jesus in your heart, you will be content and satisfied. Paul in his letters to the Philippians say, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Basically, contentment or satisfaction cannot be determined by circumstances. He has learned to be satisfied in all circumstances by the power of Him who gives Him strength. Amen. In conclusion, here in Psalms 103, it says that God loads us with his benefits. And James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God's gifts, God's goodness, His benefits bring us joy because they are God-given gifts. They are eternal gifts. They do not fade. 
they do not disappear as time moves on because God never changes His mind. When He gives you good gifts, it is forever. Amen. So these gifts of forgiveness, redemption, healing, deliverance, and satisfaction, God has given to each one of us. So this morning, receive of the fullness of God. Receive of the unconditional love that He has for each one of us. Amen. I would like to close with the last two verses of Psalm 103. It says, Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve Him and do His will. Praise the Lord, everything He has created, everywhere in His kingdom. As for me, I too will praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us remember and let us dwell on Psalms 103 today. Of all His benefits, He has given to each one of us. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we give thanks because you daily load us with your benefits. Your mercies are new every morning. So this morning, we receive of your favour for every situation that we encounter. Father, I give thanks, Lord, for those that need forgiveness, for those that need healing, that needs deliverance and the joy of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that even as they invite you once again, the fullness of the Holy Spirit into their hearts, I thank you, O God, that salvation will take place in their hearts, that healing will take place in their hearts, in their bodies. And I thank you, O God, that you will crown them with your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Father, I give thanks, Lord. We give thanks, O God, that you are good and that your mercies continue forever. So this morning, Lord, we commit ourselves to you and we thank you, O God, for the work that you are doing in our lives. We give thanks in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a great week ahead. Amen.